Welcome to this session. Here is a talk about untapped malicious potential or DDoS reflected distributed denial of service by Erin Leverett. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks for coming to the talk. Uh, we'll get started. This is uh, based on an academic paper that I wrote with Aaron Kaplan at CERT AT. Um, he's a pretty talented incident responder, but he also loves networks and mathematics and DDoS, and we work on stuff when we can. Um, this is basically what we think of as attacker math. So um, I was working at the Center for Risk Studies in Cambridge about um, a year ago, and someone from insurance said to me, what's the biggest uh, DDoS that could happen? And I thought, I can't really answer that. I don't know how to answer that. And then uh, I started speaking to Aaron Kaplan and the Cyber Green Project and the Measurement Lab Project. And we'll go through all of this in the paper. And Ookla and Shodan and like combining all these ideas into this, into this soup. And we figured, OK, we think we can estimate the maximum uh, reflected distributed denial of service, at least for IB IPv4, if not for IPv6. So we're going to show you the methodology that we did and the answer that we got for 2016. Um, I don't have 2017 data yet because I'm waiting for the data sets to come in. Um, and then you can take the idea and go, nope, that's wrong, or yes, I think that's cool and I want to expand on it. Okay? So, all right, this is the answer that we got. 108.49 terabits a second for the year 2016. So that's the, the global amount of uh, reflectors and amplifiers scaled back by bandwidth. And I'll sh again, I'll go through all of this in the talk. Um, and to put that in perspective, in 2016, we saw one attack that was 1.2 terabits a second. So this suggests that we're seeing one one hundredth of what could possibly happen, right? And that's why we wanted to go after this idea of the maximum instead of just waiting for a bigger and a bigger and a bigger attack. Um, this is an estimate, and you'll see where the fuzziness in the estimate is as we go through the methodology. So feel free to help me out and give me new ideas about where to get data and how to approach this. But previously, people had uh, pretty much said it was impossible to estimate, and we think it's possible. Right? The number might be wrong. You might have a better way, but we think it's possible to estimate it. So I'm here to, to push that radical idea. Now, I don't know why you like DDoS. I mean, some of you maybe just like pretty network diagrams. Some of you may hate uh, CCTV cameras or something. Um, some of you uh, might want to protect your websites or the websites of human rights defenders from being DDoSed. Um, but one of the ideas we also want to push forward is this idea of internet pollution and that there are reflectors out there in the world that are essentially polluters. And you hear a lot of stuff about, well, there's a lot of internet of things in Africa. We'll blame Africa, uh, which is one of the things that we'll challenge in this presentation. So, that was the RDDoS potential of the IPv4 internet in 2016. So how did we get there? First of all, we need to take into account various protocols. There's a lot of academic literature about different protocols being used as reflectors and what their amplification factors are. So you can go and find out what the amplification factor for NTP is. Uh, it's variable, by the way, but we use an average. For DNS, SSTP, SNMP. And these are, for the most part, some of the larger reflective uh, protocols that we see used. And then there are a few more that are showing up every day, but the methodology easily extends to new protocols if you want to add them in. So we got some funky stats from uh, cybergreen.net. We worked with them on some of their measurement methodology, and they gave a final number uh, that is much, much larger than the number we give because they haven't scaled back uh, by bandwidth, right? OK, so eventually we come to this idea, hey, we can estimate the effect of these UDP, UDP amplifiers. So quick basics of UDP amplification. Right? There's going to be a little bit of uh, equations in this presentation. Uh, I tried not to put more than one equation because people usually leave the room in about 50% for every equation that you put on the screen. But we do have a little diagram. Most of you are used to uh, UDP, right? A little refresher of UDP amplification. You know, you've got uh, a pipe with an attacker who spoofs a packet, basically saying uh, you know, the address of the packet is uh, the victim. And then uh, the victim receives the packet once it's been sent to the amplifier. So if I say my address is V and I want, I want to know whatever uh, the number of NTP uh, members of this list are, uh, that gets reflected up here. And essentially we want to know what the bytes per second are flowing uh, from the reflector to the target. And of course this is replicated thousands or hundreds of thousands of times and the victim receives too much traffic and falls down. Okay. 
So here's your amplification factors for a number of different protocols. And for those of you who are interested in reading such things uh, before you go to bed at night, you can spend time reading these couple hundred page documents on different amplification factors under different conditions. Uh, but to save you time, here they are. So you can see DNS, uh, we've used an average of 41, NTP, we used this one, um, and so on, right? So these amplification factors have been the focus of academic literature for you know, the past 10, 20 years, right? Like amplification factor matters quite a lot. And in fact, gaming servers turn out to have a relatively high amplification factor, but it's a protocol that people don't look at as much. Um, and it's because they all inherit the same protocols from one Quake engine to the next, from Unreal Tournament to whatever. Um, and they, can, they are not only um, servers that you know, get DDoSed and lose a lot of money, they are also servers that can provide a reflector in other ways. Um, so you can do some you know, research into that if you're interested in the different network protocols, right? Okay, so the point is you have amplification factors. That's one part of the puzzle. The question is, how many reflectors do we have, right? Well, if you go over to the Cyber Green project, you can see the number of uh, open recursive DNS servers. So this isn't just DNS servers. This is using a particular scanning technique to, to figure out whether this is a misconfigured DNS server from the perspective of amplification. So would, if I sent a packet to this DNS server, would it reflect and is it spoofable to another uh, entity? Um, so you can see here that we do this for NTP, for SNMP, and SSDP. And incidentally, CyberGreen has an API, so you can query their API and get these numbers for any particular year that you want, which is particularly useful. You also don't have to do it by country. You can do it by ASM. Anyone who works regularly with IPv4 data and geolocation knows that geolocation is a bit fuzzy. It's not always accurate. Um, so we do you know, this country level analysis because it's useful for policy people. But if you prefer to place any of these reflectors into a particular ASN or ISP, you can do that as well. And I kind of prefer that technique. We didn't use it for this estimate because that's, uh, there's something like 80,000 ASNs in the world and I had to run these queries using uh, Bigtable and, and Google Dashboard and so on. So it's easy to run 200 queries rather than um, 80,000, but I'm continuing on with that work. So this gives you this, these crazy numbers here. And as you can see, these numbers are much higher than our numbers and they come out to like you know, 1,000 terabits per second. And if you look at the available bandwidth of the internet, this just doesn't make sense, right? Like these numbers are just too high and they're hard to understand. They give a ranking and you can use this to rank different countries and um, different ASNs, as I said. All right, so we forgot something in the formula, basically, right? Which is, what's the maximum limit that I could um, get from a reflector? Come on, join me. I know we're in Norway, but interactive. <laughs> Right, their upstream capacity, right? And to some degree, even their downstream capacity. So if the downstream capacity is x bits a second and x bits a second upstream times the amplification of the, of the downstream, right? Um, now, usually the upstream is going to be lower than that. But in some weird world where the network was built differently, it could theoretically be a very large upstream pipe. And then the limiting factor would be the downstream times the amplification factor, right? So upstream capacity needs to be factored in, right? Um, as we said here. All right, so here's the equation for those of you who like uh, maths and sigma notation. Um, and here's where we basically got this data from. So the number of reflectors and what countries they are in or what ASNs they are in is from this website, which has, a, like I said, an open source API that you can go and query. And I encourage you to use their data because it's pretty cool stuff, right? Um, and here, uh, Measurement Lab, does everyone know about Measurement Lab? Does anyone know about Measurement Lab? Of course, of course Maria does. Um, uh, you use their data too, in some way? Sometimes, yeah. yeah? Okay. Um, so they essentially have a bunch of um, speed tests. Well, they, they build a widget for doing throughput tests on different networks. And then they distributed this widget to many, many people around the world, and it gets used in all sorts of things. And now they have this giant body of something like millions of, uh, of NDT uh, tests, right? And so you can use this data for all sorts of things to look at the throughput on a given day, on a given month. So I did the entire year for each individual country, right? Um, and we'll talk a little bit about whether or not the assumptions around that are particularly good. Um, I used medians and quartiles, and again, we'll capture that in a minute. Um, and feel free to take pictures if you want links and so on. So, yeah. 
Um, I, I particularly love these resources. Um, I mean, this one's just about reflectors and so on, but these two are amazing. So if you contact Measurement Lab, you have to jump through a couple hoops to get access to this data, but those hoops are not serious. They're basically just like, can you give your credit card to Google and get a login? And you don't even have to use your own money to query the data. Measurement Lab will pay for your queries on their giant data set uh, because they have an open access grant to do that. You just have to give the credit card to like, get access to the Google BigQuery. OK, so basically this is just saying take a minimum of the upstream capacity and the amplification factor times the downstream capacity for each country in the world and sum them, right? OK, so why the hell would you guys do this, right? <laughs> um, because we're weird, because we like networks, and we wanted to see what would happen. Because sometimes when you look at networks and network data and you analyze it and you visualize it, you find interesting things. And hopefully I'll show you some of those. Um, I guess the other point was if you can estimate the total set of DDoSs that are happening in the world or could happen in the world, then when you look at the number of DDoSs that did happen and the number of bits per second that they used, you get a sense of how much attackers have utilized of the available potential. And this gives a very different perspective than just waiting for the next big attack. Um, this is my, yeah, go ahead. Factor ISP to ISP DDoS detection and limping. We'd love to, but where the hell am I going to get this okay. data for every ISP in the yeah, world? No, so yeah, so, um, so to answer your question, in this equation, it's not factored in, but we realize that it's something we would like to factor in. And since we've done this, we are occasionally working with individual ISPs who know this, and we go to them and work with them to figure out what their individual uh, view of the world is. And right? Make an average for that. Exactly, right. And we might not necessarily publish that, but it'll still help the ISP, right? So, you know, um, personally, I prefer to publish these things, but you can understand that there's a bit of uh, sensitivity about some of that, right? But we're happy to work with that data for anyone who has it. And you've hit a very fantastic point as well, which is this number is what Aaron and I consider to be the potential at the edge of the network rather than across the core. So core capacities from one country to another or one particular submarine cable are going to be very different than this maximum number. So we don't really think that you can have a single 108 terabit a second attack, but you might be able to have 100 one terabit attacks, right? Subject to the capacities of the individual pairwise interactions of all those different countries or all those different ISPs, right? So we also recognize that this is a core flow problem and we're going to have to estimate the core flow or buy capacity data. So all of this was done essentially for free. Now that we have a little funding behind us, we can start to buy uh, data about what capacity of what pipes exist from one place to another. Okay, so on to the findings. Um, I apologize for this. I made these uh, graphs when I was in uh, Amsterdam. So I'm just going to attack you with like lots of psychedelic uh, pie charts for a moment, um, which is kind of how I felt when I was making them. But really what I want you to take away is this one is DNS. Whoops. This one is NTP, this one is SNMP, and this one is SSDP. Now, going back, we don't really need to pay attention to all these different countries. What I want you to look at is the top five or six different countries are, um, you know, five, five to ten countries in every case, in every graph, are responsible for 50% of the potential, 50% of the pollution of the Internet, if you like. And if you pay attention as I go through the graphs, you know, watching sort of over here which countries they are, they're usually roughly the same countries. So it's US, Korea, Japan, Russia, China, right? Um, here they are again. This time we've got Brazil showing up a little bit more than the others. Um, US has fallen on the SSDP graph, but Korea is still up there, right? So essentially, you know, if we went to these five to 10 countries and we said, you need to make a concerted effort to clean up your reflectors, it would have a massive effect on the availability of bandwidth for booter and stressor sites. Does everyone in here know what booters and stressors are? Does anyone? No. Okay. So booters and stressors is kind of slang on the internet for, I start a little website and I scan for a bunch of reflectors and I know how to do DDoS and then I sell you DDoS as a service. Ostensibly this is like, I will stress test your particular website and you pay me and I just happen not to check that you own that domain name, right? So it's like this gray line kind of legal sort of vague thing. Now these people get arrested reasonably often because they're trying to profit off of something that's a bit shady. Um, but 
It's when they monetize that they really go wrong. Like if you were an activist and you didn't charge for this, you'd probably get away with it. But um, just a thought, just a random thought. Anyways, the uh, booters and stressors, they get caught all the time. So the question is, how much are they charging, right? And how much bandwidth do they have available to them? Are they using all of the malicious potential that's out there? Are they fighting over it? Are they using those same reflectors? And we can start to use reflector honeypots to understand a little bit about who they're actually DDoSing and why. So the point is, removing 50% of the bandwidth might make a difference, except they're only using about 1% of the bandwidth from 2016, as far as we can tell in the first place. Right? So we've only seen 1% of the problem. Another point that uh, I want to make is basically, this is the number of reflectors. Uh, sorry, number of reflectors is here. So this is the average count for a given country over an entire year. Please forgive this particular country. This is a a catch-all in our data set for we, we don't know where these reflectors are and they don't fit into a convenient um, country code standard such as A1 or A2 which is anonymous proxies and uh, satellite connections. But all of these others you can see that the potential this is the the median potential that we calculated is very uncorrelated with the number of reflectors. right? And if you think about that that's intuitive. So a bunch of people have home routers and they have like one megabit upstream connections. We don't really care about them. It's the ones that are in the data center that have 10 gig connections that are a problem if they can fill that upstream 10 gig pipe with rubbish data, right? Okay, so what does bandwidth distribution look like around the world? It's amazing, it looks uh, strangely similar to wealth distribution. You have these crazy curves. Now this is for Russia, but you can basically see that um, this is relatively, we, we analyze this, and you see roughly the same curve in different countries in the world uh, with some changes as to you know, the relative uh, percentage um, and the available bandwidth, right? Obviously in some countries in the world this is up here or it's down here, you get the idea. But the curve is roughly the same, and distributions matter whenever you're trying to do estimates and averages, right? Okay, so we also wanted to say um, how much does download versus upload speed really matter in our own data? And like I say, I love graphing things just because sometimes stuff stands out, right? So we're looking at all this data and this, this looks to me you know, like a nice clustering and I kind of understand what's going on. And then you see these two countries in the world that have you know, massive upstream pipes. Like, I don't know who they are, I can't really go into the MLab data and find out, but it's quite curious. Um, and I'm still trying to find out who has, you know, uh, terabit connections inside the US, right? Maybe someone's just having a laugh. I don't know. All right, so what if we looked at global trends over the time? We calculated this for multiple years. Do we see anything interesting? So this would be basically like the cyber green metric, and this is what happens when we normalize it by throughput, right? And then once we did that, we said, well, what's the percentage revealed as the throughput increases? So another way of saying this is we've had roughly the same amount of reflectors and DDoS capability in the world over this time period. There's been a little bit of growth in the number of reflectors, but not a crazy amount of growth in the last four years. But what we have seen is a massive growth in bandwidth. And that massive growth is represented in this number here, right? Now we do know that some of the data from scanning is not as accurate for these years as it is for this year, which is why we chose to publish this metric. But, you know, it gives you a rough idea, right? Rough metrics in a land of no metrics at all, essentially. So, but this is, this is the scale of the problem that we've seen so far today. So like all the DDoS attacks that you've ever seen are living inside this number, or all the DDoS attacks you saw in 2016, right? So if someone increases the bandwidth of a particular country by a massive amount, we're going to feel it. And that's interesting because it's not to do with the number of reflectors you're rolling out, it's to do with increasing your bandwidth. Okay. So a thought experiment, what if I skip all the complicated maths and stop doing the minimization function and just chuck stuff out um, and basically look at the number of protocols. So we added Mirai in here as well instead of just doing the UDP amplifiers. Uh, and we just do a single average for all the countries in the world. So we take you know, the average country count of reflectors, the average country download and, and upload, and we just come out to this number. And we can see it's not quite the same. It's not maybe a good metric, even though it's faster. I think I still prefer to be a bit more precise. And I'd even like to see if ASN level data gives us much more uh, accuracy. All right, so what do we get when we look at this? I like this graph. I built this one especially for FS cons because I thought you might be interested more in the countries that are neighbors and here. Um, if you are interested in other countries and you want me to build you a graph for any other countries, uh, feel free to ask. But essentially this is, you know, look, 
Um, Sweden's biggest contribution is in SSDP. So Sweden could go out and work on its SSDP reflectors. Um, you know, Norway, actually roughly the same. Uh, but a bigger problem in Norway with Mirai Botnet than with, uh, say, Denmark or Finland, right? And this collectively uh, totals, you know, 24.42 percent in, uh, or sorry, 24.42 terabits a second. Uh, so essentially, this is about a quarter. The Scandinavian countries are responsible for about a quarter of the potential pollution uh, in that number that we saw earlier in 2016. Which I think is interesting, right? Now, how many DDoS attacks actually flowed from here is another story, and that's another body of research that you could do if you were interested. So you could go and study attacks that happen and try and trace where the traffic flowed from, which countries, to see if that somehow is a rank correlation with the numbers we have, and that would disprove or prove some of our numbers over time, which would help a lot. Um, so there's a lot of open research here, which is why I'm presenting it to you. I'm hoping you take some of these ideas and go, all right, I don't like the Cyber Green data set and Measurement Lab is rubbish, but I've got data from my ISP and I can do this on a local ISP level or I can do this for the world with UCLA data or whatever, right? All right, so if you increase the bandwidth, you also increase the reflected DDoS harm on others. So this is essentially a measurement of risk to others, also potentially risk to yourself because you could generate this much traffic inside Norway to attack things in Norway. So it's kind of a weird self-harming slash harming others kind of thing. Um, the old metric is 0.3% of the new improved metric, so sometimes it's really important to go and rethink things and, th and have a theory of constraints, like what are the limitations, bandwidth, obviously. And we chose throughput rather than capacity, uh, just to make that clear. You could do the same calculations with capacity, but we wanted to take into account the fluctuations in uh, bandwidth available on given days, because that means we can study things like, is it easier to DDoS someone in June than it is in January? All right, uh, a lot of people will present to you all the great work they did without any of the failures or the trauma. Uh, Aaron and I are not those people, so we're going we're to share um, some of the things that, uh, that we got wrong. And one of the ideas that came up in this project was like, we want to know this number. We want to know what this maximum RDDoS number is. Um, and we think we might be able to roughly calculate it, but the best way to get the right answer on the internet is to be wrong first. So just publish the answer, and then everyone else will correct you. Uh, with an enormous amount of pedantry that you can go and follow up, uh, which is wonderful because it improves your thinking. So we figured we'll just publish first and the rest of you will tell us that we're wrong. Um, so please do so. Please go out and calculate this uh, in a better way. Um, so does anyone scan the internet regularly here? Have you ever scanned IP before? Yeah. And did you use like Unicorn Scan or Nmap or Zmap or yes, all? Maria's like, yes, I've been doing this forever. I've been through all the tools, yeah. Um, so did you find some of those tools better or worse? Not for the reasons of scanning results, but like, did you get more complaints when you used one scanner than you did from another, or? Um. Like, I'll, I'll, I'll share some too, right? Like, I found if I scan above 1,200 packets per second, I get more uh, abuse reports. And so I lowered below 1,200 packets per second, got less abuse reports, and was able to scan a little more quieter. And, and gather more data. Um, that was one lesson learned. Um, another is that it's hard to tell, like if BGP routes change in the middle of a scan, that looks like there's just no response. <laughs> you know, can you correlate these things to make that, to know what the, if you did 40 scans, how do you know which one's the best one is a problem we had. Yeah, and then storing data as well. Um, anyways, I guess this, you, you may or not, may not want to share any of that. Um, this is, uh, Aaron is a native German speaker, I'm not. So uh, for those of you who are German speakers, yeah, measuring is difficult. Uh, we use Jared Mosh's data for uh, the scans. Um, another thing that I learned years ago scanning uh, was that scans look different from different parts of the internet and also different times of day based on who's online. So if you scan Brazil in the middle of the night, you get plenty of responses. If you scan it early in the morning, everyone's still asleep. Um, so, you know, there's some differences at time of day of scans, as well as where you scan from in what part of the world. Um, in particular, when you're looking at cyber green data, when people realized that cyber green was keeping track of the number of reflectors, they would firewall off uh, any scanning machines they would find, and suddenly their metrics go like, you know, this, right? And 
they look really good. Like, we've cleaned up all our reflectors. Give us more money for our incident response team or something. Um, so we were looking for more monotonically decreasing changes, which suggests that people are cleaning up reflectors rather than just firewalling them off. And that's another reason to move your scanners around from one country to another periodically to get different viewpoints. But then you run into the problem of um, how do you synthesize different scans or incomplete scans at different time. So that's why we used averages across the entire year for, for counts. Uh, occasionally we have a complete loss of data, no scans, sometimes for some protocols. We think it's important to publish where you have no data very explicitly so that people can see that that's missing data, not a change in the state of the system that you were measuring. Right? Uh, sometimes you get fake answers. We've started catching a few people spoofing responses and altering uh, some of the scans. So there's some people who are gaming some of these statistics. And then how does it compare against other scans? So a lot of times I like to use multiple data sets for the same task just to compare them. And then when they're wildly different, I can ask questions about why. Right? Um, so we're still looking for some sort of gold standard of how to do scanning and make scanning measurements comparable. People have a tendency to just think it's super easy, uh, but collecting, storing the data and making it usable in the future uh, can be quite a challenge. Um, so this is a site we like to use. It keeps track of different uh, scans from different ASNs and the scan volume and the time of day and what ports they're scanning for. So it's getting to the point where you can essentially fingerprint scans. You can kind of get a sense of who's scanning, like you might not know who they are, but you might see their patterns. And you see some boxes scan for different protocols and different vulnerabilities that changes over time, some sort of opportunism. And then you see some scans that jump from one box to another but are consistently the same, and you know they're kind of measuring the background uh, of the total system. So collecting things is kind of the easiest part, uh, you know, storing the data and then uh, before we synthesize it. But you still have the problem of making sure it's available if you want to build an API. Filtering uh, any of this in some way. For example, what do you do with uh, things that MaxMind doesn't have a country for? Uh, you make a country for it, you know. In the, in the NATO country codes, uh, XY is often used for these kinds of things. So we just pumped any reflector where we couldn't geolocate it into XY. And uh, filtering out all irrelevant answers. Um, yeah, sometimes the internet gives you very, very weird answers indeed. We see some really funny stuff coming back in some of the banners uh, when we scan. Um, these are some of the things that Aaron used to enrich uh, the data. So trying to use the current BGP table. Um, DNS is another one. It's difficult to do historical DNS. So if you have data, you want to grab associated aggregated data or synthesized data at the time that you did the scan. Because if you go back and look at it later, the DNS that's associated with this IP address may not be accurate. Um, yeah, country codes, it's a lot more complicated. A1 and A2 are two favorites. Um, upstream bandwidth, currently using MLAB, but we're thinking about using UCLA as well. Does anybody else use this data? No? No experiences of it? OK. Um, and then our main mistake was not to archive a bunch of reference data, which we've started doing. Um, so backbone capacities, we know this core flow problem that we we're talking about. It might be different from one ASN to another. Um, so our number would be reduced again based on those numbers. But it's a kind of a pairwise-ish mm -hmm. reduction. And we're still trying to figure out how to do that. So we're working on an academic paper towards that end. If you're interested, happy to chat with you about where we would get the data or how we would calculate it. Um, consistency is difficult. Um, we spoke to some of the, or rather we didn't, but uh, some friends of ours spoke to booters and stressors anonymously um, to try and find out what their limits are. So if you assume that they're bragging a lot uh, when they're offering their services, you'll ask them, how much are you capable of? And we assumed that we'd have some wild variation in what, what was available because they would be bragging. And it turns out a couple of them said 15 terabits a second uh, was the maximum they could really imagine. But none of them seemed capable of delivering that. So again, it was kind of, is this some sort of mythology within the community, or is it some accurate limit that they know about that we don't? Uh, obviously, we can add more protocols. Um, we know there's not just four reflectors. We've seen some recent changes out of China in the most popular reflector protocols changing in the last three months. Um, so some great opportunities there. And then how do you deal with things like Mirai, right? It's not really an amplification factor. We just have to kind of assume it fills the upstream pipe. Um, and we do know that Mirai tests 
uh, for uh, upstream bandwidth uh, during the infection process, right? Okay, so we think the max reflected DDoS is calculable, particularly for IPv4. For IPv6, I don't know because we can't really scan it. I mean, we can scan parts of IPv6, but not the entirety. And even if we could, we'd have some storage problems and we still don't know the proportion of different reflectors. We have some ideas about estimating that. So if you're interested in extending this work to IPv6, there's some easy, relatively easy work that could be done there to make a rough estimate. Uh, we also think that this uh, varies in time. So my most recent work in the last few days has been taking the 2016 data and slicing it by month and seeing if the number varies over the month. Um, we know that the counts vary. We know that throughput varies. Uh, different ASN contributions might be different at different times. Country contributions will be different at different times. We know our data can be improved. Um, but the point is, eventually we think, like hurricanes, people used to just throw up their hands and go, who knows how big the biggest hurricane can be? We think that's no longer the case. People can estimate these things and predict these things to some extent. And we think you could do the same with DDoS. And that might have a nice effect on how we handle DDoS in the future. Um, if you have any questions, please go ahead. And thanks for listening to me waffle on about attacker math. BCP38. Right, yeah. So, so BC there's a whole bunch of great information uh, economics work around BCP38 adoption, and I'm a supporter of that. But we wanted to kind of do this work slightly independent of that debate because we wanted to answer this question first. And if you like that question, where we're going with this is let's say a DDoS mitigation company can come to me and say that the average cost per bit per second is. $30, some number, right, for when they're mitigating DDoS. Then I could turn that potential into an impact to the economy for different countries, and then I could turn that into the value that the global community might be willing to pay to get certain ASNs to implement BCP38. So I'm trying to go there with the economics, but like I'm still missing pieces to the puzzle. Uh, let's go here first. I can kind of imagine it going that way, but not, like not easily. Every country. Yeah. Um, it's a good question because it would probably depend on routes, yeah. which of course would be changing. So let's say we estimated it, and then what's the churn and route changes that would then break our attack pattern? Mm -hmm. But yeah, you probably could conceivably go in that direction. Mm -hmm. So if we solved that core flow problem, then the reverse of that would be what's the most effective country to attack another country from, or ASN to ASN. Yeah. I mean, for a country, just deciding uh, which country you have to talk to to reduce the risk of the attack. Yes. Yeah, so if you were taking a pairwise approach, you could say like, hey, uh, Holland, the three countries you want to speak to first about lowering your risk are blah, blah, blah instead of this kind of global perspective, which works for a quick estimate, but is not necessarily realistic. So yeah, and I think that would be really exciting if, if uh, ASN started to use it that way, and maybe even embedded into some of their peering uh, agreements and contracts. Yeah, your question?
Okay. Al Qaeda. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They have this spoofer project. I actually didn't know what it stood for, but thanks. <laughs> yeah, the spoofer project is great. This is like kind of the ammunition, right? Mm -hmm. And then this, the, the ISPs that uh, allow spoofing is like the guns. So it's mm -hmm. kind of like looking at the both sides of the problem. Mm -hmm. uh, has anyone uh, combined that like this so that you can have an aggregate score of worst, worst offending ISPs? Like we are hosting the most amplifiers and we also allow, we have this many blocks where we mm -hmm. allow so far, not that I know of, but like, feel free. Our, uh, Aaron and I have both agreed to go and speak to RIPE. I'm a big fan of the RIPE Atlas project and, uh, and internet cartography in general, so I know about Kaida as well. I was going to go see RIPE first because I have contacts there. I don't have contacts at Kaida, but that was my next stop, uh, was to go and speak to them. And also anyone who has a list of DDoSs that occurred, because one of the ways we can disprove or prove our own theory, like both Aaron and I are huge fans of scientific method, so we try and find ways to disprove our own ideas as we go along. And one of them would be is if you could find a set of DDoSs that occurred at a particular time in history that exceeds our estimate, then we would know that we got it wrong. Yeah. And with, with the insurance, going back to the, the original impetus that mm -hmm. you mentioned, uh, was the, in, I get the part about for DDoS mitigation, how much would it cost, but I'm not sure if I understand the link insurance because insurance is paying for it's a maximum probable loss so or a probable maximum loss right so then the answer wouldn't the answer to what's the biggest possible DDoS be big enough no because um, let's because say let's say you know, know only three houses can be burgled in a neighborhood at any given time then you sell enough insurance that you sell insurance to 20 people but you know you're only going to have three losses at any given time, and you can do the math to make sure, right? That's why. Yeah. Um, one minor concern with mesh um, reflectors mostly. Um, I assume you can't detect rate limiting on mm. reflectors. Mm. Um, so that good actors can't actually be distinguished from bad actors. Yeah. Uh, I assume it, that still uh, the number of good actors actually is low, mm -hmm. but I guess considering, for example, BIND mm -hmm. or DNS, New mine has built in tools for just right limits. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, yes, mostly, yeah, you, you mm -hmm. understand this concern. Yeah, yeah. Um, essentially, that assuming that all the available uh, bandwidth can be used by any particular product is inaccurate, right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Most of that you can't distinguish between a good and bad actor. That is, that's most of the my concern. Yeah. Um, well, some of the way that we do that, um, I didn't talk much about in this presentation, is honeypots. So uh, by using DDoS honeypots, fake reflectors, we can get a sense of which ones are actually being abused and who the targets are. But then that's kind of a different body of work to this, right? Then you're focusing on empirical DDoS instead of in theory DDoS. And, and we really wanted to go the other way with this, which was in theory DDoS, right? Um, and now we're starting to compare empirical DDoS events against this to see whether it makes any sort of sense. So basically you set up some software which would record this as a reflector, but this wouldn't actually be reflected. Uh, yeah, it would just log who the target was supposed to be in. Yeah, yeah. I think the IP6 space is going to be quite, it, you could scan it quite interesting. Cause mm -hmm. I mean, it's not as aggressively policed, mm -hmm. but then the matter is, I guess one of the interesting questions about IPv6 is, is the proportionality different? Like, let's say I can say something like, I don't know what the numbers would be, but 0.05% of the internet is DNS servers. And some small percentage of that are uh, configured that they could be reflectors. Does that match in IPv6 to IPv4? I wouldn't expect it to. But if it did, we could quickly calculate. So this is why I'm saying there's more research that can be done there. So you could scan a subset of IPv6 and show that this kind of holds or doesn't hold, or, and then you know, move on from there. You don't like we basically have to take a statistical approach to IPv6. Because, right. I mean, at least at the current time, you have stuff like ISP routers shipping without IPv6 rules, and you have <laughs> lots of consumer devices right. that are just online. Right. That's the whole IP thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
But yeah, that's the same thing as in a smaller. Yeah, but it would be very, very helpful, right? And then that, that could conceivably be adopted by business, which would make a difference. I mean, part of the problem with this is we go, here are these numbers, and it doesn't really have a business impact, so no one cares. But, you know. And it's also sort of depressing. It's like, okay, I can hire 300 gigabits per second of uh, Akamai protection at a crazy amount of money, but the total available out there of everyone is <laughs> far exceeding that. So it, it you know, makes some questionable statements about our current approach to defending against DDoS. Um, before you ask about, if anyone's familiar with the list of DDoS attacks, the back and behind and so on. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, I know about uh, DDoS Mon. I've just applied to them for an API account, but I didn't remember about Jigsaw. Jigsaw is the Jigsaw a Google project? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I had vaguely heard of it, but yeah. So they make available that data in some way? Um, I don't remember. That's all right. I can, I can go and do my own homework, but thanks for that. So do you think I could almost do a one-for-one -one replacement of MLAB data and uni data? Uh, not, no, not, not replacement. I'd say they're complementary. Okay. But yeah. 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 And yeah. Just for other people. You already presented today. Did you already present today or are you presenting later? I'm presenting later. Okay. And you're going to present the uni probe. Okay. I was just going to give you a plug. So go to, go to the talk about uni probe. And you have more data from mobiles, which I think is particularly interesting. Um, yeah. Okay, well, thanks for the jigsaw thing. Good question. Yeah. Question by Chris. So, they have a lot of studies. I mean, how many percentages or some. So, do you remember the Internet Census Project? Vaguely. They had a good sense of cyclicity, but I didn't end up calculating it from the data. Right. Um, which is why we went for average counts. So, I guess there's count cyclicity and then there's throughput cyclicity. Yeah, so it's the last one that I'm most interested in. Ah, we could probably have a little hackathon of that here at FSCon because mm -hmm. I've got access to the MLAB data. You've probably got access to Uniprobe data and we could have a quick look. Mm -hmm. Just like pick a couple days in history and say what's the variation. I, I do want to graph that variance in that data, particularly in some of the censorship stuff that, as you can tell, we've had conversations <laughs> before at multiple conferences, but some of the censorship stuff is not sort of traditional blocking that you would think of, it's throttling. So like Turkey and SSL and Wikipedia and so on. So being able to detect throttling is a little more challenging than detecting um, just raw blocking. But you could do that by using these background tests to dis you know, the country that has the highest variance in throughput scaled back by the magnitude might give you a sense of um, that they're doing some throttling. Cool. Anything else? All right. Well, thank you.